Well, good afternoon, everybody. I have one o'clock and we'll get started. So welcome to the Gardening for Success with the Laramie County Master Gardeners Program and kind of a advanced master gardener program. Our speaker this afternoon is Dr. Karen Panter from the University of Wyoming, and she has taught a lot of programs for me. And one of her specialties is plant propagation, seed starting, greenhouses, high tunnels, hydroponics. I think the list goes on like as long as my arm. Um, growing cut flowers for production is another one of her topics. So she's quite the horticulturist and I'm very pleased to have her in here to teach us today about roses because I, I, my roses don't survive the winter. <laughs> it's, they're kind of annuals in my yard, which is really kind of sad. So <laughs> just despite trying. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Karen and she's going to hopefully teach us how to keep our roses going longer than an annual. So Karen, I'm going to turn you around so you can see the okay. class. Great. Yeah, that'd be good. Hi, everybody. And if you've got questions, just just go ahead and just shout it out because yep. I can't really watch it from here and 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 just just shout it out. Right. And there'll be ample opportunities for questions. Um, what I would like to do is kind of break things up into several small sections and we'll have discussion and questions after each section. So there should be plenty of time. Um, I am at our research and teaching greenhouse this afternoon. And the main reason for that is because virtually everything I need is over here instead of at home. So. I uh, did schlep a few things with me that we may look at this afternoon, um, including a uh, one of the knockout roses. And uh, so we'll talk about a lot of that later on. Um, thank you, Catherine, for that introduction. And Catherine's right, I have done quite a few talks for her and I have another one scheduled actually in June. Um, and uh, so that'll be a fun one on advanced seed propagation. Um, I've been here since 1998, so it's been almost 23 years. And I have 50% extension appointment, which includes an awful lot of this, exactly this sort of thing. I do master gardener training. I do um, a lot of field visits, a lot of consultations with uh, commercial growers, greenhouses in particular, but I also um, can deal with nurseries and a host of other types of operations. And uh, I, uh, the other half of my job is split between research and teaching basically. And the research projects, the most recent one as Catherine mentioned has been cut flower production in greenhouses and high tunnels. And we just wrapped that up last fall. And uh, kind of in a lull at the moment, I've got a little small, tiny little project going on uh, outdoors in my raised beds on using loose uh, wildflower seed mixes versus um, the paper mats that have the seeds impregnated in them. And uh, I started that last year and we'll do another go around this year. So that's kind of fun. I'm at a point in my career where I can do a lot of things that are fun, <laughs> which is kind of nice after 23 years. So before I came up here, I was with Colorado State University for 10 years. So I've been in extension now for 30, over 30 years. So I know the systems well. Um, like Catherine said, please don't hesitate to ask questions. I'm very used to um, being interrupted. It doesn't bother me at all. I teach a number of courses, a lot of them in this particular room. And so I spend a lot of time answering questions at whatever time, so it doesn't bother me at all. Um, so if you do have a question, please just let us know either holler or something um, and we'll get your question answered, I hope. Um, with that, I will go ahead and I think I have screen sharing capability. Yes, thank you, Catherine. All right. Well, this is a topic that um, is 
quite interesting, actually. It's um, a lot of fun. And sadly, a lot of people think roses are just very, very, very difficult and just kind of a, on a different planet as far as plant material goes. But as you'll find out today, roses are plants and we know how to deal with plants and there's nothing to be afraid of. <laughs> it's just that there are so many of them that it's really difficult sometimes to figure out which one you want, how to handle it once you have it, and then how to ensure that you get numerous years of growth out of it. Oops. There we go. Okay, um, today what we're gonna talk about in the next couple of hours, I don't know that we may spend the entire time uh, kind of depends on your questions. The reason that I'm mentioning this is that if there's time at the end, I can take my tablet and hook it up to the internet to our uh, Zoom um, class this afternoon, and I can give you a little tour of our greenhouse here. Um, but that's only with time permitting, and I have to be done by three. So um, I've got another appointment yet this afternoon. So we'll see how we do. But these topics today include various types of roses, some basic planting procedures, and it's not difficult. It's just like planting a tree or a shrub or any other type of a perennial plant. Watering, mulching, fertilizing, pruning, which is another topic that people have a tendency to be a little nervous about because they're always afraid they're gonna ruin their rose plant. It's very difficult to A, kill a rose plant and B, ruin it for life. So we'll show you a little bit about that. And then we'll talk about some of the insects and mites and diseases that affect them, which as you probably know, are quite a few. The good news is that up here in our climate, um, it's dry and cold. And so we don't have the pest pressure that there are in uh, lower elevations and warmer climates, but they still occur. So we'll talk about a few of those. And this winter care is probably the most important part of the whole thing. And Catherine alluded to the fact that she has difficulty getting her roses through the winter. And this is probably the most important section of the entire discussion we'll have today um, because winter care, as with any other tree, shrub, perennial, uh, whatever you have during the winter, it's important to make sure that they're protected and watered. Then if we have time too, we'll talk a little bit about propagation. That's a little tough to talk about in a few minutes simply because there are so many different types of roses, but I can clue you in on some references that I use and also some basic methods that you can use for vegetative propagation of roses or seed propagation. This happens to be a Harrison's yellow. The previous one, Uh, that's the Austrian copper, two of my favorites. So, and this is my contact information. I try to put it first because if someone has to leave early, um, you can always uh, get it right now. Um, the best way by far to reach me is via email. Um, you can leave a voicemail message on my phone, but I'm not in my office very much. We are starting to filter back into our offices on campus but I don't know that I will still be there much this summer. I've got so many activities and things going on outside of the office, but you're always welcome to send an email message at any time. And uh, that I can get email at any 24 seven, plus I have it on my phone. So email works really well. All right, let's move on. We all know there are tons of different types of roses, and these are just a few. There are also a number of different ways that roses can be classified. Sometimes they are by these types of growth habits. Sometimes they are by the flower size. Sometimes they are by flower color. Sometimes they are by whether the flower is double or has more than the normal amount of five petals. Uh, there's just a whole bunch of different ways to categorize them. 
And I'm going to kind of go back and forth between some bulletins and written material online. And then also a few videos that I'm hoping they're relatively short, um, but they do illustrate some of the points that I'd like to make and then we'll have some discussion afterwards. So as far as the types of roses go, uh, this bulletin from the University of Illinois, I really liked. Um, we're not gonna read the entire thing, but you'll be able to look at the, um, uh, the URL later on. I'm not sure if uh, Catherine is recording this or not, but can you see the, you probably can't see that. Hang on. Oops, wrong one. There we go. Now you should be able to see the bulletin. Got it? Okay. Important thing about stopping sharing and then starting sharing. But this uh, University of Illinois Extension Rose Bulletin has got a number of different um, pages to it. And at the end, there is also, and I unfortunately I forgot to get into it myself, um, but if you're interested, they do have an app that you can use um, about roses and the University of Illinois information. As far as types of roses go, um, this is one way. The species roses are my favorites, and those are the ones that like the Rosa nutcanis here, the Rosa multiflora here, which are the seeds. Um, but these are the types that haven't been bred and are natives. Uh, vigorous. Um, they may not have some of the resistances, however, that we are looking for in some of our roses. Then there's the old uh, European types, the gallicas and damasks and albas, mosses and centifolias. And then there's some of the older repeating blooming old roses, such as the bourbons and portlands. And then there's the modern ones that most of us are more used to, the floribundas, the hybrid teas, um, to the, a lot of the grafted roses are in this category. And then the shrub roses, which is another really great um, distinct group of roses. We're not gonna go into specific varieties this afternoon. The reason is there are literally thousands of them and it's very easy to get lost in, in the minutia. So the best way to deal with how, what type of rose you want is to A, look, we'll, I'll repeat this later on in the talk, but the first thing is to look for at least a zone four, if not a three. Um, over there in Cheyenne, Laramie County, you guys are a little lower than we are here, elevation wise. And so you might be able to get away with a uh, 4B maybe, um, but definitely a four. And if you can find a three, that would be best for cold hardiness. Um, the other things to look for, then you need to decide what type of shape you want. Do you have enough room for a shrub rose? Um, do you just have enough room for maybe a, a climber that might um, accent a wall or something like that? So the, the plant growth habit is another thing to look for. Then think about color. And then once you've decided all those, then you can get into the literature and determine which varieties you might like. There's just too many of them for us to discuss today. There are too many of everything for us to discuss. I am not a variety person and uh, it's easy to get lost, completely bogged down in the different varieties, just petunias. I mean, there's literally hundreds of different petunia variety, so we're just not gonna be able to go there. So, all right, let me go back to the slides. Okay, there. Questions so far? Okay, great, there'll be plenty of time, so. All right, like I mentioned, uh, the key points about dealing with the different types of roses is just determining and, and being aware that there are numerous classifications of them. 
um, and make sure that you've got, got a variety rated to at least zone four in most areas in Wyoming, including Albany County and Laramie County. And uh, like I just mentioned, there's just way too many varieties to discuss each one. The next topic we're going to talk about here is rose planting procedures. And this again is not difficult. We've all planted perennials, annuals, trees, shrubs, vegetables, you name it. And roses are no different, they're plants too. And so I wanted to show you a couple of short videos. These are actually from, and they are on, the American Rose Society website. And I don't know if any of you are, I'll show you where that website is later on, but they have a wealth of information about all the different types of roses, how to care for them, how to do various things with them. Um, I just found it to be a really useful resource. So we'll look at a couple of short videos and we'll have time for questions after each one. And we that also the get the commercials. I'm sorry. I don't, I have the free version of YouTube. <laughs> there we go. Finally did it. You bought your first mail order own root rose. Up to now, you probably bought them from the local garden center, already potted up big old things with cranes and backhoes to plant them with and things like that big two by two foot hole. And you said, well, I want to try a different rose. I want to try an own root rose. And I'm hearing so many good things about all of which are true, by the way. So you went to the website, you picked a rose. You said they sell them in bands and liners. Well, what's a band and a liner? Well, it's a little bit smaller, but okay, let me give it a try. I've been hearing all these great things about it. You picked your ship date, the date arrives, you dig your hole. Oh, it's rose planting day. Does it get any better than this? And if you pack, unpack your first own root liner rose and you think to yourself, is that it? I'm going to kill it. The first choice you have when your own root rose arrived after being shipped to you in the mail is to plant it in a pot, grow it on for a little bit, and then put it in the ground. That's what we're going to talk about here. Basically, what I'm going to use is a bigger pot. In this case, it's a one-gallon pot. You can also use a two-gallon pot. I wouldn't go to a three-gallon pot. That's probably a little bit too much. A one or a two is plenty big enough. We want to try to basically get those roots growing. And a one-gallon pot, particularly a black one, is nice because you put that in the sun and it warms the soil from all over, and those roots actually grow faster that way. Okay. The other thing is just a good potting soil, a good basic potting soil. You can mix a little compost into it. I mixed a little bit of organic granular fertilizer in there, just a little bit. And it's an organic fertilizer because that's time release. I'm conditioning the soil as well. That's what I mixed into that as well. Now, I'm going to bring you in closer and show you how to transplant this and give you a couple little tips as well. Uh, when I first unpack it, there might be a few yellow leaves from being shipped in packaging. That's no big deal. I'm not going to worry about that. I might even see some leaf drop. On the plant when I first plant it, uh, you might see a little bit of wilting when you first plant it. It's been shipped, it's been in transit, it's been through a stressful time. Don't worry about it. Water it, take good care of it, it'll be fine. I'm going to go ahead and put some of the potting soil on the bottom of the soil. This is no different than planting any other plant. Roses are plants too, after all. And then what I'm going to do is, however, I am going to plant it a little bit deeper than it is in the container. And here is why. You can see this rose here. See how it wiggles back and forth a little bit? That just comes from planting when we first do the transplants from those tiny little rooted cuttings into these train into these liner pots. Okay, by planting it a little bit deeper, I can use the soil to brace those canes. I'm going to go about half an inch deeper than it is in the pot that it came in. And what begins to happen, as you can see, is that begins to stabilize the rows. And I would do the same thing if I planted outside as well. By the way. All right, can you see that now? How I've got that in there a little bit deeper, about half an inch to an inch deeper is where it is. And that has begun to stabilize those canes, which is what I'm really after. Now, the only other thing I'm gonna do after this is I'm gonna put it outside in sunlight, probably where it gets morning sun. I'm not necessarily looking for a spot that gets full afternoon sun. That might be a little much, but as long as it gets six, seven hours of morning sun, it'll be fine. I brought you in real close here to talk about planting them in a hole directly in the ground with this own root rose. This is the same little white pet that I showed you in the other demonstration. Again, we take the tag aside. I've dug a hole. I dig a hole about as big as uh, like a two gallon container, maybe about 10 inches across, 12 inches deep. 
if you live in heavy clay, like where I live here in South Carolina, all right, to get a two foot by two foot hole involves small explosives. And you know what? Homeland Security really frowns on that kind of thing. I dig a hole about as big as the pot itself, maybe a little bit bigger. If I'm planting this in the ground, for example, I'm going to dig a hole about this big around and about that deep. There's a new parading theory that's going on. A lot of that new soil, that living soil around it, has got all the endo and ecto micro rising in it. That's why I don't feel you want to disturb <clears throat> that, all of that life that's taken so long to create and take it out and sterilize it, replacing new, new soil. Dig a hole big enough to get it in and big enough to add some amendment, like I did when I showed you how to plant the rose directly in the ground in this little band, okay? Don't worry about the two foot by two foot hole when you're planting these kind of roses. I'm gonna take some of this amendment, in this case, composted horse manure, and I'm just gonna mix it with the native soil at about 50-50. This is what I've already dug out of the ground. This is my native soil here. Now it's been mended a little bit over the years before we ever planted here, but that's basically what it is. I'm gonna go ahead and backfill this hole a little bit, make a little spot to hold the bottom of the plant, I'm gonna slip it out of the pot. Now, just like I did, this is where you have to just kind of play with it. Just like I did in the rows in the pot, I'm going to plant it deeper, okay? Because I want to prevent that wind rock about an inch deeper than it was in that pot. I'm going to go ahead and mix a little bit more amendment. Mix that up. I'm just putting it right in the ground. Pick it up a little bit. Can you see already when I pile that soil up around it, how the rows now becomes more stable and more self-supporting? That'll also prevent the top sun from getting to that root ball that exists and drying out so quickly okay that's in the ground that's already a little bit more stable the last thing i'm going to do is take some hardwood mulch and i'm going to mulch around this very very heavily and the reason i'm doing this is because i want to make sure this soil doesn't dry out that basically covers the two methods of what to do when the rose first arrive you can put it in the pot or put it in the ground now what's the best way to do it it's not a one size fits all solution. There isn't all in the ground or all in the pots. It has to do with a couple of things. First of all, your comfort level and your skill level as a rose grower. If you've been growing roses a long time, you're probably more comfortable putting them in the ground. If you're getting kind of new to this and kind of want, ah, oh, let me just take a few extra steps here to make sure this works out this first time, go ahead and use the pot. Well, here's what I'm gonna really tell you to do. Trust your garden's instinct. Look at the plant when you unpack it. If it's a smaller plant and you think, oh, that might need a little bit of help, the pot is your solution. If it's a big plant that's booming right along, you're thinking to yourself, oh, you know what, what the heck, put it right in the ground. It's not a one size fits all. Trust and use your instincts. Now that you've got all your roses planted, either in the ground or in a pot, let's talk about expectations. What can you expect from that rose during those first initial two, three, four months of growth? How big are they gonna get during that first season? Well. The answer is they're gonna grow very quickly, probably more than you expected. What I've got here to illustrate that is I've got three different varieties of roses and three pretty different classes. And these are all from the same crop last summer. These are the liner pots that we're currently shipping from roses we grew last summer about 10, 12 months ago or something like that. So I wanna show you an example. And this is Papillon, which is Floribunda, that's the liner. This is the exact same rose from the exact same crop last summer, but transplanted into this pot about eight to nine weeks ago or something like that. You can see the difference in the growth already in that short time. Same thing with this. This is a Little White Lies, which is a beautiful little ground cover from Sean McCann. Again, this should give you a good illustration of the difference in what to expect and what to see. And lastly, I've got Aptos, which is a great little noisette, also known as Dr. Robert Corns. And you can, again, you can see the difference between the two roses in just eight to nine weeks worth of growth. Not only the thickness and the caliper of the canes, but also they've almost quadrupled in size. So that's what you can expect to see from these roses. You can expect to see some pretty good and fairly good strong growth. Now, the next thing you're gonna wanna know is, okay, what's gonna happen now in one or two years down the road in my garden? Well, let's take a look at that now. Well, this is what you can expect from an own root rose. This is Ivers Rose, lovely rose from the Beals family. Cherry red blooms, very healthy, very, very clean. There's about five or six bushes here, but this is one big plant right here, as you can probably see, right under here, okay? This plant is about two and a half years in the ground. So in other words, this was planted in the ground about two to two and a half years ago. So two and a half years ago, this rose here looked like this. This is also Ivor's rose. It's the same thing. The difference is the two and a half years. I hope ground. that's taken some of the fear out of purchasing own root roses and bands and what to do with them. I know it can be very confusing and I know it can be intimidating, 
I bought my first Owen Root roses probably 15, 20 years ago. And you know what? Sombrui, Madame Isaac Pereira. I still remember them, actually. And you know what? I have both plants at my house now 15, 20 years later. And I moved them from Los Angeles, California, here to my home in South Carolina. They did just fine, and they lived. And they're still beautiful plants today. And what I really hope we did is took some of the fear out of buying these kinds of roses, because I know it's intimidating. I know that. So the main thing I want you to remember is this. When this plant arrives, it's just a plant. It's not a rose. It's a plant. Trust your instincts. If you think it needs a little extra water, give it a little extra water. Too much sun, move it some shade. Trust your own judgment. But most of all, relax. They'll be fine. And what this does, it gives you, opens you up to a whole world of thousands of different kinds of roses that you cannot buy from anywhere other than the independent nurseries like ourselves. So that's what I want you to remember to do. So right now, after the roses are planted, relax. Take it easy. Let them do their thing. Let nature run its course. And you know the best thing you can do right now? Stop and smell the roses. Okay, any questions or comments on planting a an own root rose? I have a question for you, but I want to hear what, if you have anything first. Okay, I'm not hearing anything. So um, the question I have for you is, what is not done on an own root rose? What process has it not been through? What's that? Grafting. Grafting, exactly. An own root rose is just that. They are vegetatively produced sometimes or sometimes from seeds. Just kind of depends. Um, but they are not grafted in any way, shape, or form. And so that uh, is one big difference. Roses are notorious for having uh, different levels of activity of root systems. And some of them are grafted onto different roots that are more vigorous than the ones they may have naturally. Um, others are not grafted. A lot of these species roses, some of the shrub types, those are not grafted. A lot of the hybrid teas are, however. So, and you can tell there's another, well, you'll be able to tell the difference. Um, there's a video that shows you that, as well as um, I'll show you on this. Uh, well, actually the, uh, that's a knockout. I don't know. I don't think they're grafted. So any other, <clears throat> excuse me, anything you've thought of in the meantime? I have just a comment. Um, you know, I, I found myself thinking he's in South Carolina uh, when it comes to how much growth to expect. Uh, I'm not sure here that we see quite the same thing. No, you're probably right. But the principles still apply. Right. The idea was not to show you um, how things are done in South Carolina. The idea is to show you that um, you can get an exceptional amount of growth on your um, roses in the garden as compared to in a container. And you're right, they're not gonna grow nearly as quickly uh, here as they would there. But the soils are similar. Um, obviously there are some other differences as well. So don't let the location fool you. This guy, Paul Zimmerman, um, I, I really enjoyed his presentation style. Not only is he knowledgeable, um, but he's also um, has a sense of humor about the whole thing and has a, a really good way, I thought, of bringing things um, to down to earth, you know, we're all so used to roses as being these ethereal, magical plants. And as he says, they're plants, just like anything else. So, but that's a good observation. Other comments? I have quite a, a comment, I guess, or a question on, he said that he added just a, threw in a little bit of fertilizer into his soil. Well, that doesn't really tell me what kind of fertilizer, how much, uh, do you just do it when you initially plant, do you do it every year? 
Or what time of year do you do it? And how much? And what what exactly is in it? We will get we will get to that. That's one of the sections that I mentioned early on that we will get to here in a few minutes. He did say that he uses a slow release organic type um, granular, um, and that's fine. Um, the bottom line with roses is they're not terribly particular about the type of fertilizer. Timing is far more critical, but we'll get to that here in a few minutes. Anything else? Okay. All right, the next, let me get back to my slides. There we go. All right, the next section is, um, and now I lost my big screen. Hang on a second. There we go. Here we go, okay. Um, and the next section is about grafting, um, planting grafted container roses. And this one is much shorter, um, but this one will actually show you what that graft union looks like so that you can pick it out on the plant and know what to do with it. So, hold on a second. All right. Invisible eyelid lift strips are revolutionizing the market in the U.S. Do you have... Okay. <laughs> 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 Planting a rose, something sure to strike fear in the hearts of gardeners absolutely everywhere. Because we've made it so complicated. You know what I'm talking about. How big of a hole? Two by two? What do I put in the hole? What do I not put in the hole? What kind of soil? What kind of fertilizer? No fertilizer. Do I water it in? Do I not water it in? How deep do I plant the bud union? What is a bud union? What if it's on root? Where's my bud union? And your whole head explodes. <laughs> when I went on the internet and I Googled planting roses, I got 3.5 million pages of information. For the heck of it, I Googled broken leg. I got 3.5 million pages of that. That means there's as much information on the internet about planting a rose as there is about breaking your leg. That's getting a little bit ridiculous. Just remember the whole theme of this entire video series, roses are plants too. So I'm going to take you through the steps of planting, in this case, a grafted rose that's in a container and show you just how simple this really is and how that if you planted other plants in your garden, you already know how to do this and probably don't even need this video. Getting ready to start digging my holes, and that's why I'm using a rake. Which makes no sense at all. I certainly realize that. But let me explain. This plays into that whole how big should the rose hole be kind of thing. You know, should it be two by two or whatever? I don't go with that. I just prefer to say how big is the whole planting area and just work the whole thing. And this begins months before you actually start planting your roses or any plants for that matter. You got to have a rich soil base. So if you start three or four months ahead of time with layering in compost, working it in, raking it out, let nature do its thing and rot the stuff into the ground your whole bed is gonna be ready to go. So that defeats the entire purpose for digging a big hole and adding even more amendment. So the last thing that I'm doing before I plant today is one more layer of compost about an inch thick, then I'm gonna go ahead and start digging my holes. Starting to dig the hole, get down in there pretty good. Going about as wide as the root ball because don't forget I've amended that area all around it so I don't need to worry about getting a big two by two foot hole because this is a new bed. Now, what do you do if it's an old bed that's already got roses in it? You obviously can't amend the whole area all over again and till it all up and stuff because you'll disturb the other roses. If you've been practicing good gardening all along, you don't need a two by two foot hole in the existing rose bed either. Because what you should be doing every single year is a layer of compost and a layer of mulch. And then next year, layer of compost, layer of mulch on top of that, allowing it to deteriorate every single year into your soil and not raking it off. So therefore, your entire rose bed is already fine. So if you have an existing rose bed, the same thing applies. A hole a little bit bigger than the root ball, but dig it reasonably deep, and we'll show you why in just a moment. Now that the hole is dug, we're ready to plant the rose. This brings us to another controversy in rose boring, which is do you bury or do you not bury the bud union? First of all, let me show you what the bud union is. It's this piece right here. It's where the rose was grafted onto understock, which is this shank down here, and the root system. So from here up, it's the rose you paid for. From here down, it's understock. And by the way, bud unions do not exist on own root roses. That's a whole different thing. Now, the 
conventional wisdom has always been, if you live up north, you want to bury the bug union. Why? Well, if you get a freeze and the rose dies back to the ground, at least the bug union's underneath the soil and hopefully can rejuvenate new canes and your rose comes back. And if you live down south, we were always told to keep the bud union above the ground. In fact, maybe an inch above the ground. Why? I've never really quite been able to figure out. Because if you can bury them up north, why can't you bury them in the south? The only thing that I've ever come up with is that basically that some roses needed that vigorous understock because they couldn't survive on their own roots. Well, an own root rose doesn't apply to that. But here's why I'm going to tell everybody to bury the bud union no matter where you live. Windrock. What is that? If I don't bury that bud union, and this I've got this sticking above the ground, look how small that base is for that plant. And if I get a windstorm, that rose is going to do this, and I've even seen them snap clean off. By burying that bud union down to here, that gives me a much more stable base. The other thing that's going to happen by burying the bud union, no matter where you live, is eventually this rose will actually revert to its own roots, which in my opinion is a good thing. So no matter where you live, bury the bud union. Is there an exception to every rule? Absolutely. If you buy roses on Fortuniana and you live in sandier soils like Florida, for example, then you don't because you need that Fortuniana rootstock to basically uh, stand off a nematode that you've got to deal with. So besides that, no matter where you live, north, south, hot weather, cold weather, on a grafted rose, always bury the bucket. Got the rose in the hole. Starting to backfill a little bit. Remember, I don't really need to add amendment because I've been amending as I go by this layer of compost I put on earlier. Well, I hope that basically addresses some of the questions. The whole whole question, basically, I hope that you don't really need a two by two foot hole as long as your bed is ready to go and well amended. And if you're digging an existing bed, it's the same thing. I bury the bud and you've noticed that, so I'm not going to get any wind rock when the wind starts to go. That's going to keep that protected, so you want to take care of that. You're probably at this point just sitting back and looking to yourself and thinking, well, wait a minute, that looks like planting any other kind of plant. Bingo, you got it. That's exactly what I'm trying to tell you right now. You know how to plant plants in your yard. You know how much amendment you need for the soil that you've got. You know what kind of amendments you want to put in there. Bone meal, I put a little bone meal in the bottom of this hole. You know how much amendment you have to add depending on bringing up the quality of your soil. Maybe you need to do something that retains water. Maybe you need to do something that increases drainage. So if you've planted other plants in your garden successfully, plant your roses the same way. You already know how to do it. Because remember, roses are just plants too. <laughs> All right, questions about that. <laughs> Comments, questions? <clears throat> Have you heard controversies over how deep to plant a rose, especially a grafted one? I've never heard anybody say that the bunion is below the ground for about 10%. I didn't quite catch all that. I've never heard anybody say to put the graft union below ground before. That was the first time I ever heard that. Oh, yes, it's highly recommended. Yes. And the reason that part of this video was so intriguing to me was what? What did he mention numerous times? It's just, just a plant. plant. It is a plant. Yeah, there's something else he mentioned several times that we have a lot of out here. Wind, wind. wind. yes, he mentioned that. And that's one of the main reasons to bury that graft union is to make sure to strengthen and support the entire plant. Roses and tomatoes and potatoes are about the only plants that um, we recommend be planted deeper than they might have been in the container. Most everything else we recommend be planted a little more shallow, if anything. Um, it's easy to mess up a lot of tree plants, especially trees and shrubs, if they're planted too deeply. The exceptions um, are roses and tomatoes and potatoes. Anything else? I liked his routine of uh, composting and mulching on an annual basis, uh, which naturally ends up amending the soil so that you don't have to put a lot of work into it when you decide to plant a new plant, whether it's a rose or anything else. All right, let me get back to my slide. Oops. 
Is there another question? Well, I keep losing my main slide set here. There it is, okay. There we go. And so there are no other issues or um, questions or comments on planting procedures. That's half the battle is getting them planted properly. Okay, key points. And uh, one thing I wanted to mention here is that this is a bare root rose. Um, Paul Zimmerman in the videos discussed those that had been in containers, whether they're small liners or larger number one or number two containers. Um, but this is a bare root. And these are shipped and sold, as you probably already know, without any soil. And the reason these things are a little finicky is because it, you cannot let the roots dry out. So it's very important that they be shipped uh, quickly, that they're shipped properly with the root systems um, in some type of a moist medium. A lot of times I've seen them, I've gotten bare root material here at this facility for my propagation class. Um, and the roots are all embedded in wet shredded newspaper and that works out really well. Um, but the, the key is to make sure that those roots do not dry out. It's best if you know that you are either going to go out and buy a bare root plant or you know when it's going to be shipped to you um, and you know the delivery date, have the planting hole ready to go. And that way you don't have to worry too much about um, you know, making sure that those roots don't dry out. Once the uh, hole is dug, and a couple things I wanted to point out about that is that a bare root plant, whether it's a rose or any other bare root plant, a lot of uh, small fruits, for example, are shipped bare root. The thing is to make not only the hole a little bigger than the um, size of the root system itself, but also with a little bit of a cone or a mound at the bottom of it. And that what that does is it forms kind of a little seat for the uh, plant to sit on. Um, the roots will spread out to the sides and then you'll have the, this area right here on the top of that cone. And that way you know that there's good soil contact with the root system. So this is um, how you manage a, a bare root plant. So some other excuse me, key points about planting um, organic matter as in the videos, and we preach this all the time, good quality organic matter is your best defense against about everything. Um, plant to the original soil, <clears throat> excuse me, soil line for own root roses, maybe a little deeper. The graft union on a grafted plant should be below soil level. And if it's a bare root plant like this one, make sure that those roots don't dry out. All right, questions about bare root stuff or anything else before we move on? Ma'am? Yeah. Could you point out where the top of the bud union is? On this one, it's right here. The union is right here. Thank you. It's always gonna be a little enlarged area. Um, this is what we call, or he called the understock. And the, another name for it is the rootstock. And that's from here down. And the above part is the part, like he said, that you paid for, that that's what the variety you really want. And that's also another name for that is called the scion. Um, <clears throat> so you've got your upper part, the scion, and then the understock. Anything else? Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to go through these next three fairly quickly. Um, the thing about watering a rose is that out here, one of the what's about the first thing you do after you've planted it, water it. Um, and then after that, they take about an inch a week minimum. 
And so you kind of have to watch the weather in our soils. Um, they may dry out a little more quickly simply because of our, not only the soil, but also um, our winds. And so keeping uniform moisture is really critical for virtually all roses. Um, consistent moisture, even in the winter, and winter watering is absolutely crucial if you want any type of a perennial, whether it's herbaceous or woody, to manage our winters. It's very important that the root systems stay moist. The reason for that is that dry soil changes temperature very quickly and can actually damage the root systems just because of temperature swings. Another thing about dry soils is they heave and crack and those can physically damage the root systems and actually break them if they're heaving and, and, and thawing and cracking too much. Um, and the other thing is that a moist soil uh, tempers those temperature swings quite a bit. Water actually changes temperature very slowly. And so that is kind of a protective measure. So if you can keep the root system moist all winter long, that's really going to help your survival rate on your plants, whether it's a rose or anything else. Another thing about roses, and we'll kind of talk about this in a few minutes again, um, is trying to keep the foliage dry. Um, and there's reasons for that. Um, if you can't keep them, keep the foliage dry, the best thing to do is to water in the morning so that the plants have a chance to dry out during the day. Mulch is highly recommended and I'll show you in another uh, bulletin um, how to deal with the mulch. Um, key points about that is a couple to three inches thick each year, um, added each year. And keeping it away from the trunk and the stems. One thing I noted in the video was that um, a lot of the mulch ended up very close to the stem of the plant that he had just put in the ground. We suggest that that not happen, that you pull the mulch away from the stem so it doesn't stay too wet and rot the plant at the soil level. And an organic uh, mulch is best. And by organic in this sense, we mean of plant origin. This has nothing to do with certified organic production or anything else. This has to do with organic as, as referred to as of being from plant origin. So something like um, you know, shredded pine bark, uh, chips, bark chips, shredded cedar, or anything like that. Leaves, um, any type of um, plant material like that will actually work pretty well. And the last thing, and I'll show you um, in the bulletin a little bit about fertilizing, but as I mentioned earlier, the type of fertilizer is not particularly crucial. If it's, um, sometimes they recommend a one to one to one ratio of NP and K. Um, and that can be in the form of a 10-10-10, 12-12-12, 15-15-15, um, anything like that. Um, and the other thing about fertilizing is that if you're not sure if the plants really need it, you think so, but you're not sure, A, you can use an organ or a, uh, a granular slow release, which is what I use most of the time on virtually everything. And that will release nutrients very slowly over a period of time, usually applied in the spring, and then it releases the nutrients all summer long. Um, and um, you can also, uh, well, we'll get to a little bit more of that here in a few minutes, but um, it's not quite as crucial the NPK content as the timing of the applications of the fertilizers. And I'll show you where that all is here in a minute. All right, 
This is another one, um, part of the uh, University of Illinois bulletin that's actually quite good. And I've highlighted a couple things here for you. Um, water, the first sentence says it all. Uniform soil moisture for virtually every type of rose. And that can be done um, via sprinklers, uh, soaker hoses, or drip irrigation works very well and are actually recommended. Um, the amount will vary depending on the weather and um, you know, soil type, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but the tip, usually the starting point here is one inch of water per week during the growing season more or less depending on weather and soil and all that. Okay, so there's watering. Mulch is highly recommended, two to three inches deep and replaced as needed. And this little graphic here shows the way the mulch should be put around the plants. Leave several inches between the stem and the mulch itself. And that's simply to make sure that the stem doesn't end up staying too wet and rotting off. Fertilizer, here's the fertilizer section. Um, for, plant, for species roses, spring application, 10, 10, 10, 12, 12, 12, something like that, um, half to one cup per plant. Uh, that's just a general purpose. Um, and you can spread that in, usually you can buy a water soluble fertilizer and apply it that way, apply it, uh, mix it according to package directions and then mix and then spread it out evenly around the root system of the plant. And that's basically it for a species rose. They don't require a lot of uh, fertilizer. Other roses, however, a second application around, in our area, this would be probably late June that you would wanna do a second application after the spring bloom period is over. For continuously flowering plants, you may wanna add another fertilizer application towards the end of July in our area. And that's for the flowers or the blooms that are, are continuous. The species roses are gonna be pretty much one, one uh, blooming period in the late spring, early summer. But there are, as we know, a bunch of varieties that will bloom consistently all summer long. And those are the ones that are gonna need two, maybe three applications. There's one real important thing to remember here um, is that no, no fertilizer after mid-August. And the reason for that is we get these wonderful early fall frosts. And what a late fertilizer application in the summertime will do will, is to encourage new growth and it will be very soft and very tender and very susceptible to cold damage. So what we want to do is avoid fertilizing after the middle of August. That's basically the idea with fertilizer. It's not terribly complicated. It just depends on timing more than anything. I am a big fan of controlled release fertilizers and these you put on in the spring and you're done. And <laughs> if, uh, and there are a number of different controlled release, slow release fertilizers out there. There's a bunch of them. This one happens to be Osmocote, um, but there are a whole bunch of different brands out there and they all work basically on the same uh, principle. And that is that with increased moisture and temperature, more of the fertilizer is released to the plant, which makes sense. The plant needs it then because it, it, with warmer temperatures and more moisture, the plants are gonna be growing more quickly and will need more fertilizer. So it works very nicely. Um, so that's the fertilizer. Let's answer questions. There may be some about that. Is there an awesome coat that's specifically for roses or is it the general? No, Osmocote comes in different um, formulations according to how long they will release nutrients. 
There are three month formulas, there are six month formulas, and there are nine month formulas. And the six is probably sufficient for our, our purposes. Um, and that's how they um, are formulated. They also are formulated, some of the Osmocote or any of the controlled release fertilizers, um, some of them will have just nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Some will also include some calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. And some will also include some of the micronutrients like iron but you have to be very careful and read the label because roses will need iron in our area with our high pH soils. So it's important no matter what fertilizer you're using, whether it's a liquid feed, a granular that you mix in water or a slow release or whatever, um, make sure that it has at least the NPK, hopefully some of the micronutrients, including iron. Why is it that it needs, or um, why does it need iron in our area? Um, do you remember your discussions of pH and soil when you were going through Master Gardener training and how it affects, how pH affects nutrient availability? Okay, our pH soils are, pretty much all over seven. Most of the time they're over eight. And at a pH that high, iron is not available to the plants. And so we have to make sure that we add iron to those plants that we know are susceptible to iron deficiency. And roses are one of them. There's a whole bunch of other plants that are susceptible, but pH greatly affects the availability of many of our essential nutrients for proper plant growth and development. And higher pHs will inhibit iron availability. Hopefully that refreshes your memories because that will pop up um, not only with roses, but a bunch of other plants too. Gentleman was talking about adding um, compost to your roses uh, in between doing the mulching part. Um, what I usually mulch in the fall before winter. When huh? do you put the compost on, and how much? Um, com the compost we usually suggest you could put it on in the winter. In fact, if you mulch and compost in the winter. Um, it's available and ready to go in the spring as two things you have less that you have to do in the springtime. <laughs> so some people are really adamant about doing fall um, applications of both compost and mulch because it just gives you, you know, it, it takes two more things off of your to-do list in the springtime. And it's there and ready uh, when spring rolls around. Usually a couple of inches, two to three inches is sufficient of either compost or mulch. Too much mulch and you end up um, suffocating things. And so it's important not to put too much mulch on. The compost is not quite so difficult to deal with. Good question. When you put the fertilizer on, I heard somebody say you have to pull the mulch away from the root system and then put the fertilizer on and then put the mulch back. No. Yeah. Not necessarily. Um, if you apply the fertilizer thoroughly, to, um, it should run right down into the root zone. Okay. Yeah. What we recommend with fertilizer applications is A, they, are, they should never be applied to dry soil. And under mulch, it's probably not gonna be dry anyway. So, but if it is, make sure you irrigate lightly before you fertilize, then fertilize, and then we suggest that you also, after you fertilize, do a very light watering again, just to make sure that that fertilizer gets down into the root zone. You wanna do a light watering. You don't wanna wash it all the way out. That defeats the whole purpose of fertilizing. But if you do a light watering, that will make sure that the fertilizer is at the root zone where it's needed. And that will take care of any that might be in the mulch. Thank you.
Anything else? Hopefully that clears up some of the fertilization issues. There are some, you know, you can get fertilizer um, and insecticide combinations or fungicide combinations, and those are fine. You just have to make sure to read the label, use the product appropriately according to label instructions. It's, uh, it's like I said, more of a timing issue than anything. So make sure that um, fertilization occurs in our area, usually about now, late May, um, June, for the single, for the, those roses that only bloom once, and then um, a second application in mid-June, late June, and then a third in late July for those that are continuous bloomers. So. But if you use a slow release, you don't have to do any of that. You do apply it once in the spring and you're done. <laughs> so. Okay. I have, I have a friend who's a science teacher and she always applies Epsom salts around her plants before she applies fertilizer, saying that the Epsom salt allows the plant to absorb the fertilizer better. Epsom salt is a fertilizer. <laughs> <laughs> it's mag i think it's mag sulfate um i'd have to look it up again but yeah epsom salt we use we used it all the time in uh, mixing fertilizers for greenhouse use so epsom salt is a fertilizer you just have to be careful not to overuse it because it is very very salty and it will burn your roots if you're not careful Anything else? I hear, I see a hand in the back. Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to get Catherine's attention. Sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. Okay. Well, if there aren't any other questions about that, I will move on to. We'll just finish up on the fertilizers here just a second. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Um, and this is basically what we just talked about. Uh, mulching, watering, uniform moisture, um, especially in the winter. Mulching, definitely recommended. And fertilizing timing is, is the issue, so. The other thing that I did not mention is over fertilizing um, and with the mag sulfate or uh, which I think is Epsom salts. Um, ah, crud, I'll have to look that one up. Um, anyway, you, what you don't wanna do is over fertilize. And so a lot of people think, well, if the label says a teaspoon a gallon, two teaspoons a gallon should be even better, right? Well, no, that's not right. <laughs> it's very easy to add too much fertilizer. If anything, if you're nervous about it, just use half rate and apply more often. Um, you might, you could divide, for example, your June fertilization of your roses into two um, applications one week apart using half rate. Yeah. And that's certainly, that's certainly fine. Um, the other thing is for roses, there's no magic formula, just buy a, a good fertilizer that is useful, that is in a form that you can use easily, whether that's uh, water soluble or granules or slow release or whatever. Um, in many cases, as in my case, um, slow release is by far the best option. So, but it's, uh, that's totally personal preference. All right, pruning. <laughs> this is another area that kind of scares people. And um, I did, there is one video here. It's not terribly long about that. And it, um, I like the way it's discussed because it um, presents, and it's again, Paul Zimmerman, and this is on the Rose Society website, which so you can watch it later on if you like on your own. Um, but he presents it in a way that is very simple and um, according to the basic way the plant grows, not um, whether it's a hybrid tea or a climber or whatever, it has to do with um, how the plant actually, what the crown of the plant looks like. 
So with that, let me um, stop that share. And forgive the silly commercial again. When school isn't a place you have to be, <laughs> why not go to school where remote learning can be as remote as you want? There we go. Okay. Hi, welcome to Rose Pruning. This is an introduction to the basic teachings that we're going to show you on how to prune a rose. We're going to take it and make it a lot simpler than you've ever heard of it before, because you know what you've heard before and you've been told and how difficult this is supposed to be to the point that you just rip out your roses and just grow azaleas instead. You've heard it. You've got to prune 18 inches high, open up the center, outward facing butt eyes, make sure that it's a 45 degree angle, get your spirit level, for goodness sakes, it's gotta be straight completely across and deal with the center of the earth and the gravity. Also, make sure you get your bleach so you can sanitize between every single cut, stand on one leg, wear your best red underwear, and don't do it on a Tuesday. <laughs> no, that sounds a little silly, but it really has become that complex and it isn't. Here's the thing you wanna remember, you're only pruning a plant. It's not a rose, it's a plant. It's a shrub with flowers on it. Your gardener's instincts are what we're going to rely on before anything else. And how we're going to do this is we're not going to worry about the name of the rose. We're going to worry about the class of the rose, whether it's budded, whether it's own root, any of that information. We're going to look at how the rose grows. Because how the rose grows and how you want to use it in your garden is going to tell you how to prune that rose. Roses grow in basically two different ways. We'll start by looking at that so you can identify how your rose grows in your garden. This is an example of a rose that puts up new growth from the base every single year. They have their ancestry in the old European roses, the Gallicas and the Damasks and the Albas and the Centifoli. You can recognize this growth habit in your own garden by looking to the center of the plant and what you see are stems coming straight up from the base of the plant. There is very little branching off or very little like broken structure. There's not a lot of tweaky growth in the middle. That tells you that this is the growth habit of this rose and you want to prune according to it. Because they do put up that new growth so quickly every single year, we have luxury in how we prune these. You can prune them short like a modern hybrid tea if you want to get long stem cut flowers. Or you can prune them fairly high to get a nice shrub shape in your garden and have it covered with blooms. I normally prune this one to only about here, which is not a lot lower than it is right now. So again, to recognize the growth habit of these roses that put up canes from the base, look to the center, look for shoots coming straight up that don't have a lot of branching off, and that tells you that's this kind of rose, and that's how you have to prune it. This is the second kind of rose that we're going to look at in terms of how it grows, telling us how to prune it. These are the roses that are influenced by the Asian roses, the old tea roses, and the old China roses. They're recognizable, and the growth habit is very different. You don't get those shoots that come straight up from the base and they begin to branch out in one season. This can take two or three years to build up the structure it takes to support the top of this plant. If you look, the canes come up, then they branch, and then they branch, and they just keep branching back and forth. Even this old cane, way back here in the back, is doing the same thing. And this is like, builds itself like scaffolding is the best analogy I can give you. You need that first layer of scaffolding, then you add your second layer of scaffolding, then you add your third layer. And if you take away that bottom layer, it all collapses. And also, it takes time to build it up. That's why these kinds of roses are best left not hard pruned. In fact, you want to leave them fairly high. I shaped them up into here, four or five feet. And it's about as low as I'm going to go with these. Some people don't even prune them at all and just basically cut the dead wood out and leave them. That's a personal choice, depending on how big you want this thing to be in your garden. So again, just keep in mind, these kind of roses are like scaffolding. They build themselves up. You can recognize them because they don't have those straight canes coming from the base and they just build themselves up over time with all this different branching and a lot of this twiggy growth. And that's how you know you have this kind of rose or would prune them very differently. Okay, you're back. Now, let's talk a little bit about the tools that you're going to need in order to do the pruning. The first thing you want to get is a good pair of gloves. These are really, really, really necessary because otherwise you can really cut your hands up. A lot of people wear the gauntlet gloves that come up to here. That's okay too, whatever your preference is. A pair of secateurs, you want what's called a bypass pair. That basically what that means is the blades do this when they make their cut as opposed to an anvil pair that does this. This will crush a cane. This cuts it nice and clean. A pair of loppers, always necessary to have some pair of those just to get some of the canes that are a little bit bigger. Last but not least, little pruning saws are also very, very good to use. 
because you can that we can get down there and get some of those more difficult to reach cases. Let's talk a little bit now about when you want to do your pruning. If you live in a dormant season where the roses do go dormant, I like to start to prune them when the forsythia begin to bloom. That's nature's way of telling you that spring is on the way and the plants are waking up. It's better to do that than go by a rigid calendar. Let the plant tell you when it's time to go. When the forsythia start to bloom, start to prune your roses. Now, if you live in a season when the roses don't go dormant, you can prune basically in December and January. That's pretty customary. Some people go a little bit longer, but not much more than that. The roses that grow by building their structure up, those Asian influence roses, a lot of people, if they live in an area with no dormant season where the roses bloom all year, will actually prune those in the summer when they have their, that's kind of when they start to go dormant a little bit. But I also want you to keep this in mind. Pruning is not a one-time event. It's not like you do it and you can't touch the rose again. You can prune all season. Do it when you deadhead, when you bring the flowers down. That's a great time to go. Uh, right after that big first spring flush, it's a good time to shape it up a little bit. Don't be afraid to shape your bushes all season long. That's the best way about keeping them groomed, keeping them tidy, and it leaves a lot less chores for down the road. So that's your introduction to pruning. It's not difficult, it's not scary, and most of all, trust your instincts, because roses are plants too. Any questions on pruning before I get rolling on some more about pruning here? Would you say it's true that we can prune pretty much any time of year? I'm seeing some yeses and some noes. Why yes? Depends on what you're doing. Right. What would you do in the winter time? What kind of pruning? Just not something you don't want. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, those crossing and rubbing uh, branches, anything you won't. Sometimes you won't be able to tell if there's been any um, dieback from the winter until springtime. But if you know branches are dead, you can always prune them out in the winter time as well. Um, so yeah, and why would you say no? We can't prune any time of year. If you do it too late in the season and you prune, it causes the rose to grow more. Yeah, and that's a danger. That is, that is correct. It's kind of like the fertilization. You know, you don't want to fertilize too much after middle of August because you want to avoid that new, uh, very tender, lush growth. The same thing with pruning. You don't want to prune too late in the season, probably about mid-August around here. Um, because you don't want to encourage a bunch of new growth that could be um, nipped back by an early fall frost. Um, and the same can happen in the spring. If you prune too early in the spring, you may encourage some new growth that may get nipped with a late spring frost. Uh, so it's a little bit tricky, um, but you can always wait until usually Albany and Laramie counties, usually about that first week of June, you're pretty much safe. Um, I, we don't have forsythias over here. My guess is there's probably a few over there in uh, Laramie County. So we can't go by the forsythias blooming. So we'll just have to kind of let the plants tell us when they're starting to come out of dormancy and then we can start pruning them. Other questions, comments? Okay. You talk about climbing roses. How do you how do you prune climbing roses? Well, it's the basic same principles. Um, anything dead or dying or cross well with the climber that's going to be difficult the crossing and rubbing. But um, anything dead or dying you can prune out at any time of year. And basically, you just look at the base of the plant again, and like he was suggesting and determine you know if you want to remove um, any just to shape it a little bit but a climber you're going to want to leave the the long stems as much as possible so climbers may not actually need a whole lot of pruning other than removing dead um, or broken or any damaged stems other questions 
Okay. You did mention um, some of the equipment that is really helpful when you're pruning. And I prefer, most of us have leather gloves or um, deer skin is another um, good type of leather that's pretty tough. But always have your gloves with you. You will regret it if you don't. <laughs> um, and that's just because every single rose we know of has thorns on it or prickles actually is the technical term. Um, so always have your gloves with you. He also mentioned having a good pair of pruners. And this is my pair. Um, and also to make sure that they are kept sharp and clean and make sure that during the winter time, you know, they're clean and maybe oiled just a little bit to protect them. Um, but a good pair of pruners should last you your lifetime. Many of them uh, provide a way for you to replace the blades, and those are helpful as well. These happen to be A.M. Leonard brand, um, but there's a whole bunch of other ones out there, Coronas, uh, Fiskars, uh, uh, Felco. There's just a, a ton of them, and you do get what you pay for with them. So if you know, buy the best ones you can possibly afford. And these are the bypass type, like scissors. He mentioned that um, the anvil type, um, what happens is there's the flat blade and when you go to cut, it, it basically crushes the stems and does not cut them neatly and cleanly. And I'm still not sure why anvil pruners are even available, um, but try to avoid those and go with a good pair of bypass pruners. You'll be much happier. The next piece of equipment he mentioned was your pair of loppers and here's mine. These are also AM Leonard brand. Um, if you're not familiar with AM Leonard, it's a, um, they send out catalogs, but they have a wonderful online horticultural supply store and they carry a lot of the name brands as well as their own. Um, but this is a real nice pair of loppers for larger stems that you might want to prune out of some of your more mature plants, whether they're roses or other type of woody. Um, and the bumpers in the middle here um, are actually replaceable. Those do eventually fall out or they may um, get ground down to the point where they're of no use. And most of the time those bumpers can be replaced and sometimes the blades can. These on this one, um, yes, we can replace the blades, so that's nice. So this is another piece of equipment that is absolutely essential for pruning of any type, especially woody plants. The other thing he mentioned was a pruning saw. And some of these actually fold. You can get smaller ones that will fold that are a little easier to carry. This one came with its own little um, sheath to protect the blade. Um, but this is useful for those um, interior parts of the plant that might be hard to reach with either the pruners or the loppers. Often you can get a, a narrow bladed uh, pruning saw into the interior and that will make it a lot easier to get rid of some of the older wood if you want to get some of that out. Um, and again, there's a number of different brands of these. Um, this happens to be again an A.M. Leonard. But, uh, another really helpful piece of equipment. You won't need anything bigger than that, be, or you shouldn't anyway, because most roses um, don't really develop huge, enormous six inch caliper uh, stems. So your, your need for a chainsaw or something larger like that is probably not gonna happen. All right, questions? Okay, hopefully that helped a little bit with the uh, pruning issue, which can be a little intimidating, but it's just like pruning anything else. Does anybody remember the rule of thumb for pruning how much uh, plant material we recommend removing each year? 
Not more well, than a third. Right, exactly, not more than a third. And that goes for roses too. Some of them like the types that um, produce the straight canes every single year they produce um, more and more canes from the crown of the plant they'll be straight and they won't have any branching on them those sometimes you can prune a little bit um, harder um, but generally the rule of thumb is uh, no more than a third and that works out for um, grass too. Uh, when we mow grass, mow the lawn, this is kind of an aside, um, but when we mow the lawn, we're actually pruning the plant material, the grass blades, and the rule of thumb with that is no more than a third at a time either. So if you want a three inch lawn, um, for example, a bluegrass lawn, uh, then you might want to um, take off no more than about an inch let it grow to about four inches and then then mow down to three and you've got your one suggest a way to raise your mower i've got mine as high as it will go and it's not high enough that's just a mower thing um i there's no way to there, those are preset by the manufacturer to go only a certain height so you'd have to have a different mower that would have much more range as far as mow heights If it's as high as it's going to go, then um, if and if that's three inches, that's fine. If you have a bluegrass lawn, um, you may want it a little longer. That just kind of depends on the on the person. Okay, let's share screen again here. All right, and just to reiterate, um, it's just like pruning any other plant. <laughs> um, and like you all mentioned earlier, avoid late in the growing season. Also try to avoid too early in the spring. Make sure you've got the appropriate tools to do the job. Make sure they are clean and sharp. And one thing that didn't come out is uh, the recommended placing of the cuts, and that's about a quarter of an inch of above above a bud, and that's kind of a rule of thumb for any any woody plant. And this is um, just an illustration of how a prune plant might look. All right, now. Let's go into some of the integrated pest management strategies for like, do you want to take a break? We've been kind of going on or there's probably another half hour's worth if you want to take a few minutes or do you want to just keep going? Your call. <laughs> Catherine, is there a consensus? Yeah, there seems to be a consensus to keep going. Okay, that's fine. Kind of my rule when I teach is if you need to take a break, get up and go take a break. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> Well, that works too. So, all right. Um, all right. And I, that's fine with me. It doesn't matter to me. Um, all right. Insect mite and disease management are the next topics. And this is not intended really to show you all the potential problems that you'll see on roses because there will be problems guaranteed. And Master Gardener clientele um, will probably have questions about this fairly routinely. We don't have a lot of roses up here in Laramie. Um, there's probably some more of them at your lower elevation. Um, we do have some of the species roses like the Harrison's yellow and the Austrian coppers and things like that. And there are spots around town where there are some rose plantings, but they're not prevalent, that's for sure. Um, and I don't know if that's because people think they won't live up here. There certainly are those that will, um, but I'm not sure why. But anyway, it's, um, having said that, there are some of the insects diseases that will not really occur up here at higher elevations. You may see a few of some of these uh, pests in your area since you're about a thousand feet lower than we are. 
All right, integrated pest management. Hopefully that is not a foreign term. Uh, and let me go to that. Uh, let's see. Okay, here we go. All right. Um, uh, this is a slide set that was uh, put together by an old friend and it's about the Rose family. I'm not gonna go over every specific um, slide, um, but it is available through Washington State University. Um, and if you type in Rose management, it should pop up on, uh, on a Google search actually, so. Um, any of you who know Chris um, Hilgert, this is uh, one of the, he used to work for Washington State University Extension before he came to join us. So there's some information here about roses, forms, colors, types, et cetera, et cetera. The main thing we wanna talk about is IPM and I'll just kind of go through some of these and then we'll do a couple short videos. Um, the pest management, integrated pest management, if you remember, is the combination of multiple strategies in order to manage insects, mites, or disease problems, or weeds actually too. Um, and it generally um, is a very stepwise process. And I'll just show you a few things here that you might look for. One of the biggest headaches on um, roses is aphids. The good news about aphids is they're incredibly easy to identify. <laughs> um, they all have this tailpipes, cornicles as they're called on their back end, and they will congregate at the tops of the plants initially and then will work their way down. Uh, but they're easy to spot. They may be different colors. There's green, orange, black, yellow, a rainbow of colors of aphids, but they're all basically the same body type and they all have the cornicles on their back end. And here's one of the integrated pest management strategies for them and that's just to wash them off with water. Um, and this is where the keeping the foliage dry when you're irrigating, um, can be kind of tricky because if you want to keep the foliage dry, but you've got aphids and you can wash the aphids off, but then you end up getting your foliage wet. Well, the, the solution to that is to wash the aphids off in the morning. And that way the plant has enough time to dry off during the rest of the day and is not wet when the sun sets. They're also susceptible to some naturally occurring um, issues including bulvaria which is a naturally occurring fungus that attacks the aphids and that is available in a product called naturalis. And there are some other um, types of management including biologicals. Outdoors however biologicals are a little iffy simply because once their food source is gone they leave the area too. So you can release ladybird beetles, you can release lacewings, but as soon as the aphids are gone, so are your um, predators. Having said that, ladybird beetles have voracious appetites for aphids. This happens to be the larval stage of the adult ladybird beetle. <laughs> they look nothing alike, but that we should know that because things like Lepidopterans or caterpillars, which is the larval, larval stage of moths and butterflies, look absolutely nothing like the adults. So this is, if you remember from entomology in Master Gardener training, um, this is one of the classic examples of uh, a really good predator. Um, these could, the larvae actually eat more than the adults do. And this is a larval stage of a lacewing. And they are also very good at eating aphids. And these naturally occur, so most of the time they're going to be around anyway, and so you won't have to worry too much about natural predators because they're already there. There are also some parasites um, that are wasps that lay their eggs inside the people, the um, nymphs of the um, aphids, and kill the aphid that way. 
There are also, as we mentioned earlier, some um, products that um, are out there and you, you just have to very carefully read the label. Systemics are under fire right now because they will affect um, some of our pollinators. So we're not pushing the systemics too much. Other air barriers um, include um, using row covers such as this um, and then avoiding weeds, get those weeds out of there so the pests don't have any place to hang out. Later in the season, um, and this is an extreme case, but this could first be washed off with water to get rid of some of those aphids. If that doesn't work, if they keep coming back, which they will, um, there are some other things out there safe, which is, this is an insecticidal soap. And there's also the uh, neem derived products like azadiractin um, and there's some of the pyrethroids. There's, there are some things out there that you can use for aphids. Weed management is critical. Um, we're not going to go into that much, much other than to say use mulch and that will help. And then we get to the disease management and diseases are a little more difficult not only to um, identify and uh, ID properly, you almost have to have a lab and our, our Bill uh, Stump over here in uh, Laramie on the UW campus is our pathologist and he is real good at dealing with all sorts of things like these. Um, but some of, we do know that there are certain diseases that attack roses, powdery mildew, downy mildew, the black spot, uh, rust. Um, and I'll show you a short video about the latter two of those here in a few minutes. One thing you can do is to plant disease resistant varieties and they will say on the label or you can look it up um, early on. You can do a search for uh, black spot resistant rose varieties and they will show up. Here's another one that is kind of a, a nuisance but is really not a problem per se. Um, you may have already had calls for people bringing in samples of plants that look like this. <laughs> and that's from the leafcutter bees, which are actually quite beneficial. They're great pollinators and the actual damage to the plant is minimal. It looks way worse than it really is and it really doesn't bother the plant. And so the bottom line here is no management necessary. Um, here's another one that is a problem. <laughs> um, thrips are probably the most eaten insect on the planet and that is because A, they're tiny and B, they like to hang out in the nooks and crannies of the plants um, and they will distort the plant and make, make it pretty much unusable. Um, they also harbor viruses and uh, so the, and they're incredibly difficult to get rid of simply because the way they, they burrow into the uh, crevices in the plant and very difficult to deal with. There are some natural enemies out there that will usually take care of them. Leaf hoppers are another one that is mostly aesthetic damage. Um, they're kind of interesting creatures from the side. They look like little fish and uh, Leaf hoppers are ubiquitous too, but that's another one that the damage is pretty much aesthetic and there's really not a whole lot you need to do about them. Earwigs is another one that um, may show up on roses partially because of the mulch. Um, earwigs like to hang out in dark, moist places and usually some type of an organic bark type of a mulch is a great place for earwigs to, to hang out. And what they are scavengers, what they eat is decaying, dead and decaying plant material. And uh, so if you can, sanitation is huge. So if you can keep old dead flowers and uh, stems, etc., cleaned up, that will help keep the earwigs under control. But again, no management necessary. Yes? So some interesting research out on earwigs. Apparently, some entomologists had more time to come on their hands last year. They observed earwigs at night. They discovered that at night, earwigs go after aphids. They would. It's right here. 
<laughs> we'll feed on aphids. Yep. <laughs> yep. So they're not, a lot of people don't like them. <laughs> <laughs> Other questions or oh. but this is another one, no management necessary. So okay, and that's pretty much the insect in um, of that particular slide set. Let me Okay. This is a very short video from the University of Nebraska Extension on some of the insects that you may see. And then we'll come back and discuss one of them in particular. And I'll let you guess which one. Loves these beautiful plants. They're the symbol for love. Everybody likes to take care of them and make them look pretty. And unfortunately, we do have a few different kinds of pests that can get on these beautiful plants. We have a few different kinds like thrips. We can also experience problems with Japanese beetles. We can see problems with aphids, as well as another pest known as the rose slug. And these all attack different portions of your rose plant. If you are concerned about thrips, you're gonna be looking in the flower area. That's where they like to infest. There's a couple of different kinds that you can encounter, but the most common one is the Western flower thrips and they infest up here in the petals. And what you'll notice with these insects is small, very tiny, very tiny creatures moving around in the petals. They're almost indistinguishable from just dust. It's very difficult to see them. You almost need a hand lens to take a closer look at them. Symptoms of thrips are gonna include looking for the damage that they cause with their interesting mouth parts. Their mouths are half sort of piercing and half slurping. And so they will puncture the petal of the rose and leave a little puncture mark. And then as they slurp those fluids up, they leave behind speckling damage or stippling damage on the petals. You may also notice their fecal material. It's usually shiny and black. It looks like somebody has flecked motor oil into the, the petals of your flower. If you wanna control these thrips, you can go out with a product like Piola. You can also use neem oil or spinosad. The only warning I would give you with spinosad is to apply that maybe in the evening time uh, when the bees are not flying around the plant, and that way you can protect those important pollinators, but remove the thrips that you don't want around. With that, we'll move into the stem of the plant. That's if you want to know why you're so tired so often, look at the <laughs> It's fresh, right? That's where you can <laughs> these other different kinds of plants. The symptoms that they can leave behind are, again, stippling, as well as piles of honeydew that they leave behind their fecal material is sort of a sticky, gross substance that builds up on the plant. Aphids, you can control those in the early morning with a jet spray of water. Just get your hose out and take a big jet spray and blow them off there and they'll fall to the ground. They're too dumb to find their way back up onto the plant. You could also try spinosad or neem oil for those as well. If you go to the leaves of the plant, you can experience two uh, distinct pests that will infest those areas. The first one is the Japanese beetle. It'll also attack the petals of the plant and it'll shred those into a fine powder. If it's feeding on the leaves though, it'll leave behind skeletonized doily looking leaves on the plant. These are big orange and green uh, beetles with white spots on their butt. You can control these with a lot of different kinds of products. You can treat the leaves with carbaryl. You can treat them with bifenthrin. You can also go with Piola, and that is an organic option that will provide you about 10 to maybe even 11 or 12 days of protection. If you're gonna try and treat the beetles in the flower portion of the plant, I would again caution you to treat at night so you avoid interacting with the bees that are visiting your roses, but you'll be able to have that product dried 
and the residues will be there to protect the petals from the Japanese beetle. The other pest on the, the leaves that you can get is called the rose slug, and that's a bit of a misnomer. It's not a slug at all. It looks sort of like a caterpillar, but it's actually a baby wasp. And so the rose slug will feed on the top and bottom parts of the rose leaf. They will scrape it away and they create this window pane damage in the leaf. You can almost see through it after they've removed several of the layers on the leaf. As they get bigger, they'll feed all the way through the plant and they will create skeletonizing damage as well. Those again can be controlled with just about any of the products I've mentioned before, neem oil, spinosad, pyola. Those are some of the more organic options or you can go with strict insecticides like Carbaryl or Bifenthrin. That's how you can protect your plant, keep them looking beautiful so you can have these nice roses out in front of your house. I hope that helps. Just keep your eyes open for these pests and you'll be able to control them. All right, well, <clears throat> questions on insects, which we could talk about for days. There's one in particular that um, they mentioned there that I'm, we don't have yet here in Albany County. And I don't, my guess is that you, if you don't have them yet, you will. Anybody seen Japanese beetles yet in Cheyenne? <laughs> they're coming they will be there they probably will be up here whether that or not they overwinter or not, is a whole nother discussion um but japanese beetles are all, all along the front range in colorado they're moving west and they are moving north and south as well so my suspicion is that it won't be long before they are in laramie county the problem with the Japanese beetles is that we, they will completely defoliate a rose plant. Roses are one of their favorite foods. And as a result, the front range of Colorado, there aren't many people anymore who are even planting roses. The reason is you can't keep the Japanese beetles at bay. So um, beware. <laughs> They are coming, my guess is we will eventually see on the eastern border of Wyoming, Japanese beetles, because I know they're in Nebraska, I know they're in Kansas, and I know they're in Colorado. So keep a look out for those. That doesn't mean stop planting roses. It means just be on the lookout for them. They are very difficult to manage. Um, you can use some of the insecticides as mentioned in the video from Nebraska. Um, but again, the application time is very important to avoid having an effect on pollinators. And a lot of people just go out and pluck them, um, pick off the adults and drop them into a bucket of soapy water. Um, the adults are very easy to see. They're enormous. They're probably at least an inch long, if not bigger, and they're very distinctive looking. Um, and so some people, that's just what they do. But you can, there are some sprays that you can put on the foliage that will, um, they will ingest and that will eventually kill them. Um, but trying to keep an insecticide spray just to the foliage and not on the flowers is very difficult. So it's kind of a conundrum anymore. Um, if you want roses, you may have to deal with uh, some of these other insect pests, which are nasty. Questions? All right, there was a product named um, Piola. Anybody heard of that before? He mentioned it as one of the insecticides of an organic option. I looked it up. It's actually the active ingredient in that is pyrethrins, which is a naturally occurring insecticide that occurs in the genus pyrethrum, which is the painted daisies. And it's a very effective insecticide naturally occurring, um, but that particular product is not certified for organic use. Um, so I'm not um, I'm 
would definitely read the label on that one. If you're trying to be an organic grower, that is one product that is of natural, it's naturally occurring, but may not necessarily be um, available for organic production. So there is a difference. Okay, let's move on to some disease issues here. And there are a few, <laughs> sadly. All right. There we go. Okay, just a second. Hang on. Roses are one of those desired plants everybody is looking for in their landscapes. One thing with roses, they are known to have some of those nasty rocks and spots. Kevin Corris, a graduate student in the Department of Plant Pathology, is going to discuss the symptomology of two of the most common rose diseases that we see throughout Nebraska every year. The two diseases I'm going to talk to you about today are black spot of rose and rose rust. Now early June is when we're going to see both of these diseases appear and the diseases are favored by moist conditions. Black spot of rose, as the name implies, will start out as a black spot on the upper side of the leaf. These black spots are usually circular uh, and are small, anywhere between two and 12 millimeters in diameter. Now disease progress with black spot will start with the lower leaves of the plant and work its way up to the top. Black spot is a residue borne disease, which means that it survives our winters in the stems and the leaves that are on the ground. And in the spring, when the rain falls, it splashes the disease up onto the plant. Then you get this bottom to top movement. Rose rust, like black spot of rose, also starts with the lower leaves of the plant and works its way up. Rose rust, however, uh, starts as small, almost freckles on the upper side of the leaf that are yellow. But as the disease progresses, when you turn that leaf over, you're going to see the orange pustules of the ascospores. It's most common to see both of these diseases occur on the leaves. However, both can also infect the stems and the petioles. Now that we've actually identified what is actually going on with your roses, the next step is to determine what management strategies do I need to do to control the disease that's already here or how to prevent it from even developing in your rose bed. The nice thing for both of these diseases, black spot and rose rust, is we're actually going to use the very same techniques for both of them. And the first step with all these diseases is really sanitation. We need to be cleaning up our rose beds in the fall, removing all those dead leaves, cutting out the dead canes, different components like that. But once we're in the season, as you're starting to see that disease develop, pruning out those really infected leaves that are very severely infected either with black spot or rose, to reduce the inoculum load will really help reduce the amount of disease we're going to see further throughout the year. The other big component is these are spores that are moved with water. So preventing sprinkler irrigation, we want to make sure we're watering our roses from the bottom. So either using circle hoses or just putting the hose directly to the base of the rose to prevent that water splash. The other big thing, placement of our plants. If we're able to place a rose in an area that can get good morning sun, dry off that dew, it would also help reduce the amount of disease development. The other thing to help encourage drying out is pruning out our roses, making sure we don't have too many canes, it isn't real thick in there. So if we prune it out, we're able to get better airflow in there, leaves will dry out, we won't get as much disease. Final resort, fungicide use. 
with both of these diseases, if you're gonna use a fungicide, depending on the label and the product that you're using, which you need to look at very carefully, it's either a seven, 14 or 21 day reapplication period. A lot of times you're gonna start from the time you start seeing disease and have to go all summer long. One other advantage we have for black spot that I haven't mentioned yet is resistant varieties. There are resistant cultivars of roses available out there for black spot. So if you're gonna be renovating a new bed, wanna be introducing some new roses to the area, pick a variety that is resistant to black spot so you can avoid that fungicide application. If you use a combination of all these management strategies, you're really gonna reduce the amount of disease and possibly eliminate all disease from your rose bed. So you're gonna have beautiful, healthy roses year in and year out. That backyard Farmer is a, a program that has been going on through uh, UN, University of Nebraska Lincoln Extension for literally decades. When I was a graduate student there years ago, they were doing them. Um, so it's a long running, wonderful series. And a lot of what applies to Nebraska also applies to us. Questions on the disease issues. Karen, any comments about viruses? What's that? Any, any comments about viruses with roses? Oh, viruses. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, unfortunately, there are a number of viruses that will also attack roses. And typically, the symptoms of the viruses will be like streaking of uh, yellow streaks or yellow spots on the foliage that does not turn black, like black spot. Um, and there's nothing you can do about a virus. So you either have to remove the plant or figure out what the vector, what that virus is, and then what the vector might be. And a lot of times managing the vector is the only way we can deal with viruses. The, and the vector will spread the virus from plant to plant. Having said that, there is a range of susceptibility in rose varieties to the various viruses. And so one plant, one variety may, get, may look virusy and the one next to it, a different variety may look completely normal and wonderful. So it's just, but there are no cures for viruses. The best option is simply to remove the plant. Anything else? And yes, we do have both black spot and rust on roses in Wyoming, among other things. <laughs> um, so if you run into disease, what you suspect might be disease problems on roses, you can always contact Catherine or me or Chris Hilgert or Bill Stump. And there's a number of us who can help with those issues. I believe... Now yeah, let me share my screen one more time here. Um, just scout and monitor frequently, identify the problem. If you're not sure what it is, contact Catherine or Chris or I or Bill or Scott Shell, and uh, just some basic IPM steps, maybe all that's needed to manage the issue. Winter care, um, and this is, um, hugely important. Um, I can't mention watering during the winter enough. And then anything that you can do to protect the plant during the winter is going to help, you know, a burlap bag like this. Um, there's a, hang on, a bulletin here from New Hampshire, which has at least as cold a winters as we do. They're not as dry, but they're cold. And there are some options here, the burlap to keep the wind off of the plants and keep them from drying out too much. Um, this was an interesting idea, just making a little cage out of uh, chicken wire and a few wooden stakes and then filling it with leaves 
and inside that is the rose plant. What do you suppose would be my first inclination with something like this? What might be a problem? Yeah. What's that? Wind. Oh, the wind might take them, yeah. What else? What happens when they get wet? <laughs> they form a bunch of mush in the middle and I would be somewhat afraid that the plant would also be a pile of mush <laughs> of the winter. So, but this is one option. What you could do would be to not fill something like this with leaves, but to cover it with, um, you know, burlap or something like that, just to keep the worst of the wind and uh, everything off of it. You can also use rose caps. You can make, you know, all sorts of little cages for them. Um, there's any number of ways. You can also, a lot of people just mount soil up over the plant. That's fine too. Anything to protect the lower portion of the plant along with the root system um, from the winter is gonna help. So, let's see here. Oops. And then I did have, um, Oops, didn't want to cooperate. There we go. The most important point here, if you don't do anything else, make sure to water. And then I did have a few notes on propagation, but it's already almost three o'clock. So I don't know that we'll really be able to get into a lot of that. Um, I did want to mention um, a few things and I'm going to not share my slides anymore after this. Um, cuttings from grafted, a lot of roses are grown from stem cuttings. What you want to do is remove the flower. Any flower on there is going to inhibit rooting of that particular stem. So cuttings from grafted roses will be on their own roots and you can do your own grafting if you want to. Um, plants grown from seeds of hybrids may or may not look anything like their parent plants. And that's just genetics 101. And, um, and I have a ton of references here on seed germination as well as um, cutting, rooting cuttings. And uh, most roses seeds have very specific germination requirements and that's going to vary by species and sometimes by variety. Um, this one is one of the new knockouts. This happens to be a, and I'm gonna stop sharing here. Um, this happens to be one of the knockouts, this is a miniature one. The original knockouts were the normal hybrid T size, more of a, a bushy type, but this is one of the miniature ones. Smaller stature plant as well as smaller flowers. Um, but these are plant propagated, um, protected. These are patented. And it says on the back here, um, Breeding, propagating, reproduction of this plant um, is prohibited. And so you have to be a little careful because a lot of the hybrids, et cetera, um, the named varieties will be patent protected. It will be on the label um, and it is illegal to reproduce those. Having said that in the backyard garden, the um, protection police are not gonna come <laughs> give you a fine. Um, they're more likely to go after commercial producers who propagate thousands of these things at one time. But do beware, uh, be aware that a lot of the uh, roses are patent protected and should not be um, grown from, especially stem cuttings at any time. And there are ways, they, they actually root real easily. And once you figure out how to germinate the seeds for your specific uh, variety, um, the seeds are actually pretty easy to deal with as well. So, um, one are last. Are grafted or are they own root? Uh, some of each. <clears throat> this one is a grafted. Um, a lot of them are, nowadays are on their own roots, but you'll be able to see the graft union. Oops. Could you mention a um, um, reference for yeah. finding out about seed germination? 
Yes, I'll show it to you in a minute here. Um, hopefully you're seeing these resources here. This, the Rose Society um, is, I just found it awesome. I really enjoyed looking through that. And uh, as you know, I pulled, used a fair number of their videos, which are short, to the point, very down to earth, easy to follow. I loved them. I thought they were just very well done. Um, there is a Rocky Mountain District of the American Rose Society, and they have a Facebook page as well as a, uh, their own page. And then there's some rose breeders um, and commercial rose producers out there. There's a bazillion, but these are a couple of them. One is Weeks, oops, come back. Uh, Jackson and Perkins, of course, which has been around for many, many years. Uh, Mayon, which is a French company. The David Austin type roses have their own website, Edmonds. And then this Help Me Find is a uh, site where you can go and type in certain characteristics to find a particular rose variety that you might like. So this is what we talked about today. And I will show you the references. This book here is called the Ball Culture Guide, and this is my Bible for seeds. All it has in it is seed propagation information for a number of different categories of plants, um, annuals, bedding plants. Uh, there's a section on perennials. There's a section on ornamentals. There's a section on vegetables herbs. It's just invaluable. It's fantastic. And it's available from Ball Publishing Company. So if you type in Ball Pub Publishing Company, which is in West Chicago, Illinois, um, you should be able to get this very easily. It may be available on Amazon as well. I just didn't look. Um, but I got this one from the publisher. And it is fantastic. <laughs> it's great. Um, it's um, easy to each entry has its own page and it runs across two pages so that every species is very well documented. So that's what I use for seeds. For vegetative propagation information as well as seeds, um, this is my other Bible, uh, Michael Durr's Manual of Woody Landscape Plants. And this one is uh, includes roses, um, but it also has uh, alphabetical listings by Latin name of trees and shrubs for North America. And it is fantastic. Catherine may have a copy of this in her office. Um, a few years back, we bought a copy of this for every office, extension office. <laughs> <in the state. laughs> and it, it's, I've used this one so much, it's fallen apart and it's taped up and everything. And, um, but in, actually this is fantastic, but it includes propagation information from uh, seeds as cuttings um, on, on all these different species that are in this book, including several types of roses. So this is also a really good reference for propagation information as, as well as cultural, et cetera, et cetera. The last one I have is my textbook for plant propagation class. And this is wonderful, but it's also incredibly expensive. The other two are far more reasonably priced, but this is um, a really great resource for every type of plant propagation method on the planet. And it also includes in the back a number of um, species and how to propagate them. And that includes annuals, perennials, fruit trees, um, shade trees, you know, anything you can think of, it's in here. So this is another really good one. So those are my references. I also had pulled out my rooting hormone stuff for rootings. If you want to spend another couple of minutes, I can show you those. But there are a number of rooting hormones available on the market. Um, most include IBA and or NAA, which are auxins, which are the root stimulating hormones. Um, and they're available in different forms. Uh, this one happens to be, this is Clonex. It's a gel. This dip and grow is a liquid that you dip the stems into. Uh, this little one here, Root Tech, is another gel that you just dip the stems into. 
And then there's a, a soluble, uh, water soluble product here called, uh, I think it's Horbex, Hortus, Hortus IBA. This is a powder you mix with water. And then the last one I have here is another one called Hormex, which is a vitamin B1 and hormone comp uh, combination. So there's a ton of these out there and it doesn't really matter. You know, some are easier to use than others. You just have to look at the label and see what the uh, percent um, concentration of the rooting hormone itself is. Uh, so propagation gets to be very complicated fairly quickly. <laughs> I don't have anything else. More questions or comments? Can you please repeat what the um, ingredients that need to be in the rooting hormone? I got NAA, but I didn't get right. Them. Yeah, the other one is I B as in boy A I B A, and that stand. I, I'll tell you what they stand for, but don't worry about writing it down. But um, if you type in um, IBA auxin or something like that in a Google search, it'll come up with a product called it's indolbutyric acid. And then the NAA is naphthalene acetic acid, but they are both rooting hormones. They're very similar in structure and how they act actually work. So, and so any, any other questions or thoughts or comments for Karen? Well, Karen, thank you ever so much for taking a couple hours out of your afternoon to talk to the master gardeners on roses and trying to get them to survive Wyoming. Yep, they're not so intimidating. I, I really love the Paul Zimmerman, you know, he never mentioned who he worked for, which I kind of liked, um, which was one reason that I was able to utilize some of his videos because he wasn't spout just you know espousing a particular company um but yeah it's uh not as intimidating as one would think so yeah well, again thank you. thank you all right thank you see you later yep. thanks for again thanks for taking your oh, time no. out of your afternoon we loved it all right and Take care. looking forward to your seed propagation class in june right be that's fun. june June 15th. So, yep. Yep. I'm all I'm all ready for that one. So okay. All right. Yeah. All right. Thank you.